Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to see so many people here. <laughs> you did, right? Glad you made it, uh, made it also here. We made, uh, yeah, it was close to not making it here. We got stuck in the elevator for a second, but then it worked again. <laughs> okay, um, for today we have a few steps prepared. Um, in case you have any questions during the tutorial, uh, just wave, uh, raise your hand and then one of those beautiful people will come by and help you. Um, for those who are virtual here, you can just reach us on Slack and just ping us in the channel. Um, so what we do first is we will quickly wrap up what is observability. And then we um, continue with the OpenTelemetry project and then we just start with the tutorial. Oh, and the prerequisites. <laughs> so um, in case you want to participate, you need to have a terminal. Uh, have access to a Kubernetes cluster and um, yeah, need Docker or Podman to run some containers. If you have no um, access to, uh, not access to a Kubernetes cluster, you can use Kind. We have also uh, described in the tutorial steps how this works so we can set it up all together. Um, all right, so what is observability? Um, observability is basically or when people speak about observability, they want to know that no things about a system they don't really know. Which mean, what does it mean? It might, means we have a. Hmm. <laughs> I'm a bit stuck. Um, it's basically when we have our. But probably, uh, probably you can pl explain it for me. <laughs> Yeah, so the, obs yeah. Oh, <laughs> sorry. So, yeah, the observability is about understanding our applications, right? And we do that by looking at certain data, uh, which are either metrics, logs, and traces. Uh, and this tutorial, we will try to use all of them on Kubernetes by using the open telemetry technology. Yeah, right. So the thing is, usually people come with different solutions, and then it's hard to correlate them, but... OpenTelemetry can help us with this. So we, who is here a bit familiar with OpenTelemetry? So he played with it or something like this. It's not too many people. So who used it in production? It's probably the people who also played with it. Okay, so um, <coughs> OpenTelemetry itself is an open source project, as you all, well, most of you probably know. It's from the CNCF, and it's a vendor-neutral approach to ship telemetry data. It is a bit an overloaded term. Um, it comes with a specification, an API, an SDK, a data model, a lot of other tools uh, to generate traces, um, to auto instrumentate uh, your applications, and a collector. And this collector is the thing we will speak about first. Um, yeah, you can run this collector on, or the entire things, um, on Kubernetes or on OpenShift. Um, you can run it on your PC itself. And uh, that's what we will do now. So we go first to the OpenTelemetry collector, figure out how the configuration works, um, what we can do with it. Then Pavel will show you how the operator works. And then Severin and Pavel go and continue with an instrumentation for it. They will also show you the auto instrumentation. Next, uh, Christina goes and shows how we can integrate um, with the, using the OpenTelemetry operator with Prometheus, especially with the CRs. And then finally, Yuri comes and uh, shows us how it works with logs, so how we can get logs from our um, nodes and, yeah, what's next. So you need to open up this link. It will lead you to a repository from Pavel, and there we'll, you will find all the instructions. Should I let it there for a moment so that everyone can open it? Or you can go to my GitHub account uh, on the top. Well, you don't see the URL, but if you scroll up, Bene, uh, scroll up the other way. Okay, yeah, this one. It's, it's pinned, uh, so you will see it. And we will follow the readmes that are in this uh, repository. Okay, so what we will find here is 
aside from the abstract and the slides, the prerequisites, so let's jump on setting up a cluster. Uh, I hope most of you have installed kubectl, and in case you don't have kind, which that's what we use here, um, you can quickly install it if you have Go, otherwise you can also download the binary over here. And um, then let's see if I can use a MacBook. So this will set up our cluster. And then you can type, for example, kubectl get nodes to just see if it's up and running. Um, yeah, here we see the node is not ready yet, but now it is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> later, in case you don't use the containerized version of telemetry gen to um, generate some trace data, um, you can also use. Uh, and you should install it um, via Go, but it's not required. So next, we need to set up a few things for the admission webhook of the Open Telemetry operator. We need to install um, Cert Manager. Oops. Yeah. So, so Ben is a Linux user, and <laughs> this is a MacBook. <laughs> Believe me, it's way quicker than it was when we tested it. Yesterday, he managed to, to broke it even. <laughs> <laughs> it's Command C, right? <laughs> okay. And then Control V. Uh, Command V. Uh. <laughs> One try then. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> okay, so next we can deploy an observability backend. We just glued something together. It um, consists out of Mir, Mir, Loki, and Tempo. It worked. Okay, so and now we should be able to see in Grafana dashboard, which is also directly pre-configured. I will open up a new tab. It's not this one. Here. I recommend opening a new tab so that you don't um, need to forward the ports always. I guess it's there now. Pending. Yeah, so the backend deploys a couple of uh, Grafana projects to to store and visual to store trace data, metric data, and logs. And so it takes them some, some time to to get it up and running. Oops. It's not only the MacBook, it's also the keyboard layout. Um. Okay, so we have no data, but it's up and running. Okay, aside from that, um, let's see if I can get it on the screen. So that's an image you will find when you go to the uh, Open Telemetry Collector documentation. And um, it displays basically the architecture of it. And we can see it has three major parts. On the left, we have the receiving side, which is here the OTLP collector, the Jaeger collector, and the Prometheus receiver. And um, <clears throat> they are slightly different. For example, the OTLP collector is a um, passive one. It waits for messages and listens on a specific port, and the Prometheus one is an active one, which just scrapes data. Um, that's basically the types you will get there. 
And next we have the processors. The processors are then used to filter data, enrich your data with the Kubernetes attributes. You will see it afterwards. And uh, finally, we can then export the data to different data stores. That's what we also do today. We send data to Mirmir, we send data to Loki, and they all use different exporting formats. There are a few more components you will find when you go to the documentation. Um, for example, extensions, those are used for handling authentication or connectors, which are used to, for example, generate traces, uh, metrics out of traces. And um, yeah. By default, the open telemetry collector is um, available in the Docker repository. It's maintained by the open telemetry core maintainer team. And um, for Contrib, there is basically everything included you will find in a Contrib repository. Um, in case you don't, uh, the core thing is not sufficient for you and you, don't sh you shouldn't probably use the Contrib one because it includes all the things you don't need. You can also build your own collector. There is the Open Telemetry, uh, Open Telemetry Collector Builder available. And this is a manifest how it looks like. So we can just put together what we would like to have in our distribution and then go ahead. Um, finally, there is a configuration. That's what we have seen on top. Um, so we, it's divided into these three parts. We have the receiving part. Here it accepts uh, gRPC on a specific endpoint, which is um, yeah, the default one, I just placed it there so that you see which port is used. And um, then we use a batch processor to just say, uh, save some overhead and the logging exporter to um, see on the console when telemetry data is arriving. Finally, we need to specify pipelines. This is basically which receiver um, gets telemetry data and where should it go. So we can have different database destinations. We can have different kinds of databases, what we have later on. Um, so you can try and get this configuration using this curl link uh, or just copy it. And then running a collector is also quite easy. We have this uh, Docker command here, so we just run it locally. Um, it forwards the ports, gets the collector configuration mounted in, and then just sets it as a parameter. So how does it look like when such a thing runs? Let me open a new terminal. I hope I'm in the right folder. No, I'm not. Just download this thing. It's a directory. So now here should be the Select the configuration, this looks good. And there it is. So it shows us um, the exporters are loaded and now, now it's waiting. So next, we can generate some traces in case you installed it locally and you are not on a MacBook. I think there is something different. Um, you can create another container which then does the same what we see here on top, calling telemetry gen, setting what it should generate, and send data there. So we just pick here traces. And this was, again, the collector. Oh, yeah. Looks like I picked metrics, not traces. Yeah, but we now we see here the uh, metrics arrive. So in case we want to see more details, we can then just go up again in the configuration and change uh, the verbosity, which is there somewhere. Um, yo, that's so far it. And now Pavel will show you how to get those things up and running on Kubernetes. Yeah, so, so we started with the collector to kind of show you how to use the collector locally to, to play with it because by playing with it locally, you will get, uh, you can get it very quickly up and running and you will see if your configuration is correct or not correct. 
Uh, so if you are starting with the collector, I would definitely recommend you to first uh, run it as a Docker container and then uh, use the operator. Uh, so for the operator, um, first of all, I would like to talk about like why, what, what is the Kubernetes operator, right? And um, the Kubernetes operator is a component that you can deploy to your cluster and it will kind of expose new functionality to your, to your users on Kubernetes, right? It, uh, it's, this functionality then is, is, is exposed, sorry, as a custom resource definition. Uh, and it usually hides complexity of the application, in this case, the open telemetry collector. Um, and the operator usually supports kind of the, the application upgrades. It can as well fix any kind of breaking changes of that application. So let's say if the auto collector like kind of breaks the configuration, the operator is able to, to fix that on your behalf. Uh, and it as well kind of allows you to scale the application uh, a bit more easier. The open telemetry operator uh, then kind of offers free or solves free use cases. It can deploy the open telemetry collector, right? Deploy provision and scale it up. Uh, then it can allow you to instrument your business applications on Kubernetes. Uh, there is right now support for instrumenting Java .NET, Node.js, and Python. And last but not least, it integrates with the Prometheus ecosystem. It can read the pod and service monitors um, and distribute the scrape targets across deployed collectors. Uh, we'll see that in the, in the metrics se section later. So for the CRDs that the OTEL operator kind of manages, there are two of them. The first one is for the collector and the second one is for the instrumentation. Uh, the operator itself, uh, it's a deployment, right? We have to deploy it to the cluster and we have to create the CRDs as well. Uh, we can deploy it by kind of uh, creating or applying the operator manifest files from the open telemetry operator release page um, or we can uh, install the operator through the operator hub uh, there is like an install button or on OpenShift there is directly operator hub where you can just type in I want to install the Altel operator and uh, just click a button the Altel operator uses the third manager that we already installed um, and so we're gonna just install the operator, the third manager step you can skip. I'm not a Mac user either, so I have to figure out how to change uh, to terminal. How do I call this? Command one? Okay. So let's, okay, it seems it's there. And we're gonna check the installation by getting the pods from the operator system namespace. This is the namespace where the operator is installed. Okay, it's up and running. Control one again. How, how do I kill this? Uh, control C. Ah, control C, not command C, okay. Okay. So and now I would like to speak about the, the collector CRD and then about the instrumentation CRD. Uh, so what you can see here uh, is the collector CR, uh, one kind of instance of the CRD. And there's a couple of configuration options that you can set. The most important one is the config. And that's the place where you can put the entire collector configuration that we saw from the, you know, the step that Bene showed us. Um, then there is config for the image, and this is the place where you can configure your distribution of the collector, or use the contrib or the core one from the open telemetry upstream. Then there is a mode where we say the operator how we want to deploy the collector, if it should be a deployment, stateful set, daemon set, or sidecar. And there is configuration as well for sampling, for, sorry, for autoscaling, or exposing the collector outside the cluster. 
For the sidecar, if we create a CR with the mode sidecar, the operator will not deploy the collector. Uh, then you have to use the annotation and put it on the pod spec of your application, and the operator will inject the collector's sidecar to your, to your application. So now I'm gonna create the collector CR. So this is the, uh, the spec. It's pretty much what we saw in the previous example, but in this case, uh, there's a couple of exporters. We're gonna export uh, through OTLP to, to Tempo, Mimir, and Loki. Uh, and you know, Loki is a, is a log system, so logs gonna go to Loki, uh, metrics to Mimir, and uh, traces to Tempo. Okay. And now we're gonna check if the collector pod was created. And we see it's up and running. The, the operator, it on, not only like creates the collector deployment, but it as well creates the, the service for the, for the collector. Um, so now I'm gonna get the, the service. And we see it exposes the OTLP for receiving gRPC and HTTP. Now we're gonna change the CR uh, by using kubectl edit, and we're gonna add the Jaeger receiver. Then we're gonna apply the change and we're gonna see that the operator will expose the Jaeger ports on the service. That's a wrong command, no, no. Oh no, it's here, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna enable just the gRPC, I'm not gonna write all these Thrift protocols. Uh, so I have added the, uh, the Jaeger receiver to the receiver sections, uh, but by doing this, it, the, the receiver is not enabled. I have to as well add it to the, to the service section of the config and to the traces pipeline because Jaeger works only on traces. I'm gonna save the config and we're gonna get the, the services of the collector. We copy it. Yeah, it, now we see there is a, as well a port for Jaeger gRPC. Okay, so this is one kind of functionality of the collector, of the operator, the, the collector CR. And the second CR is the instrumentation. As I mentioned before, the instrumentation allows you to instrument your, your business applications. Uh, and this is the, uh, the CR, how it looks like. The most important config option here is the exporter, where we define the OTLP endpoint of the collector. The operator doesn't automatically you know, configure this for you. You have to create first the collector and then set the, the collector endpoint in the instrumentation. Uh, then there is configuration for the open telemetry SDK, which is you know, the sampling configuration or the propagators, or you can as well configure the, the instrumentation to, to set any uh, kind of resource attributes. We will see that later in the demo. Uh, 
Um, okay, and we're gonna use the more the instrumentation CR in the next step. Uh, but first, Severin will start with the manual instrumentation. Um, so now we're gonna be instrumenting the application. Uh, we're gonna use the manual instrumentation and later the auto instrumentation. So you see, you know, what are the differences and you will understand how the auto instrumentation can dramatically simplify the instrumentation work that you have to do if you want to get telemetry data. Awesome, cool. Uh, yeah, let, let's talk about the, um, <clears throat> the application. Let me drink a little bit first. I could, could also make some music here, like it's five glasses, so. <clears throat> some in between entertainment, so. Um, I, I will talk a little bit about the application first and about the, the instrumentation itself. So actually, if you really want to stand up for a few minutes and just listen and, and then do that. Um, so what we need, of course, now is a, is a sample application, right? We need something that we run in our cluster. I just want you to give you quickly like how this, how this application works. It's not fairly complicated, so think about it. It's a, uh, it's a game of dices, right? So you have two backend services, and they choose a number between one and six most of the time. Um, and they give back this uh, number to a front-end service, and this front-end service then just simply tells us like, hey, the winner of this game is Bob, or the winner of this game is Ellis, depending on the people playing this game. Uh, this app also comes with a load generator, so this will make sure that we have a lot of traffic going on um, in, in our application, in our environment, right? Okay, so let's let's talk about instrumentation first. So, so what what do we mean when when we talk about instrumentation? So, when we talk about instrumentation, this is really the moment where you take your code and you add in logs, traces, and metrics, right? So, you weave that in into your application to make it observable. Um, there's now two ways how you can do this. You can do this manually. This is the more let's say developer-centric approach, and we will walk through this in a minute as well. So, what you really do is you initialize your SDK. You tell the SDK where to send the data. You even can go down and say like, okay, here I want to start a span, here I want to end a span, here I want to add a metric. So this is really, as said, a manual process where you do all of those things yourself. And the big advantage of that is really you can really decide yourself what you want to monitor, what you want to observe, and what you want to add in. The other approach is automatic instrumentation. Uh, one of the big advantages, and you will see this in a minute, is that it's working just immediately, right? So you can attach it to your application uh, for most of the languages, it's even working without changing any code. So think about it, Java, for example, can use bytecode instrumentation for that. In Node.js, we can do some monkey patching for that. So you have a lot of approaches that, that can be used here. Um, and this is especially, for example, useful if you have a huge deployment of applications that are not instrumented. Uh, and then you can use something like the operator to just say like, hey, instrument all the applications running on my cluster. So think about this more like something you would need if you're an application operator and say like, hey, I don't really know what is in this application, but I want to have traces, metrics, and logs emitted by it, right? Um, when we now go into the manual instrumentation, maybe to, to send this upfront, right? So we will do some, some Node.js programming now. I don't know if, if all of you are, are good in Node.js, I'm not. Um, that's not a problem because later when we will then use the automatic instrumentation and, and run it directly in the cluster, we will just use a version that is done for you. This is really more now the next few minutes for you to just get a feeling how manual instrumentation works, right? So uh, what we have prepared for that, as I said, is a front-end application. I will start this in a minute. If you don't have, uh, again, Node.js installed on your machine, uh, you, can, you can use Docker for that. So you can, again, bring it up in Docker and you can run the same commands in, in, inside a Docker container, right? Okay, let's see, here's the app front end, right? <clears throat> so let's uh, go back and, and copy out the thing here. Mm -hmm. Right, so we go into the app Still, it's there. everything is there. So we say now, npx node mon. So node mon is such a watching service, right? So it's, so it's taking care of it now. When we change the code every time, it's just restarting that service, um, and it's now starting that that very simple application. So let's now go over into into the source code. So you see, like here is this this application. So it's not fairly complicated. 
uh, you, you have here at the bottom your your requests being being uh, being done, and it, it calls those to backend services, and then says like, uh, yeah, hey, um, player one rolls this number, player two rolls this number. But actually, I don't really care about that. What I want to do now here at the top is really initialize my my node SDK, and then use the instrumentation library for Express and HTTP to to get all of that done for me automatically, right? Um, <clears throat> what we do for that, we go into the open telemetry um, documentation. Uh, so let's go there in a minute. Right, so we go here into the JavaScript getting started Node.js instrumentation. We can skip a few things because as I said we have already our sample application so we can skip uh, top part where you can just have a very simple express application. We have this already. Uh, in the very first step, we install those dependencies. Um, this should work fairly quick because in that uh, node we are running, let me find it again. It's this one, right? Um, no. Where's my... Ah, I needed to put it... Yeah, I'm sorry. Where's the... This one, yeah. I just need to stop, of course, the process and and put this in here. Uh, yeah. So this installs, as I said, the SDK, the API, some auto instrumentation libraries, um, and and some some SDK again for the metrics. And then in the next step, as I said, we can make use of that. <clears throat> in the application itself. So the documentation here says like, hey, create an independent file of doing that and use required to load that module from the CLI. But you can also really copy that out, what we see here. Uh, just just take it and, and put it into, into your source code. Uh, let me jump over here again. So you go to the top of this index file and you put it here and you see like, let's uh, load all the modules we need, node SDK, the exporters, the auto instrumentation, and then also let's initialize all of that. So for, for the start, we use a console exporter for traces and metrics. We use all the uh, instrumentation libraries, and then we just say like, yeah, start the SDK. So let's save this again, uh, and then let's see if it's working. So let's do the um, node mon again, if we are lucky, this is now uh, taking a little bit, a little bit longer. Okay, so and you already see like it, it's dumping out a, a bunch of traces that are just generated in the beginning by the instrumentation of the FS module. Uh, but what we can now easily do in another terminal, we can send now a request to that. I hope that goes well now, right? So, yeah, don't worry about the internal server uh, internal server error because the thing is there, there's no backend service, so it's complaining about that. Uh, but what we should see now here, right? So you see now traces or spans specifically being dropped to the uh, through the console, and and now of course the next step is we want to have that emitted to to the open telemetry uh, to the open telemetry collector, right? And what we do for that. Uh, we, we need to replace the span exporter and the metric exporter here to something uh, that, that uses OTLP. Um, let me go back to the docs. There's a documentation there now as well that, that gives you all those exporters, right? So here in the case of, of Node.js, it's, it's the OTLP exporters and the, the SIPCAN exporters. And again, we, we can simply copy out a little bit of that code. Uh, so we take the things here at the top um, and we go back to the to the code, uh, yeah, scrolls in the wrong direction sometimes. Sorry for that. Um, and you see like I just add those those modules in. The only difference we make, we use gRPC, right? So there's different modes how you can use OpenTelemetry or the, the OpenTelemetry exporter, uh, but we will use here the, the gRPC, right? Uh, here's the, let's copy that, the trace exporter. Uh, the metric exporter also put it like that. Um, <clears throat> and then we should be able to to send that back to the um, to to the how is it called the the collector right so the, the only thing we have to do now differently we, we need to set the right environment variable uh, which I don't have in my head right now. Let me check this real quick in the code again. 
uh, or we can do it like that. So we can simply uh, change the configuration of, for example, the, the trace and the metric exporter like that. So we can put this here inside. Um, our collector is running under the name, um, yeah. Where's the slash? There it is. Hotel collector. Yeah, you see, I'm normally using a German key out. No worries about that. Um, and then the same for the metric exporter, right? So we can put it here. Uh, this should work just fine for, for both of them. They just use the, the same endpoint. Um, oh, yeah, we need to set the port, of course, which is 4317. Uh, and 4317 here as well. I think we should remove the V1 traces here for gRPC. Um, let me do this real quick. Um, and then we, yeah, restart the application with that. Give it some time to start up again. Let's see, it's not sending anything here. Where's the collector? Uh, and you see now that the collector is now here receiving spans, right? So if you look here, it, it's receiving those spans. We can also uh, send some, some requests using curl again to, to that service. Uh, it's again still giving us this internal server error. Uh, we don't see the, the spans anymore here on the console. What we see a little bit hidden here is that the span ID and the trace ID are injected into, into my log lines. And at the same time, you see like um, the spans, so the 27 spans you see here at the bottom are the ones I just generated uh, using curl, right? Um, cool. Quickly again, here, here's the source code. It, it's fairly simple, so you really just initialize the SDK using all those, those trace exporters. And here this get node auto instrumentation uh, is, is doing most of the magic for you, right? It's loading a lot of instrumentation libraries. But what you then also can do, um, if you go down a little bit in the source code, um, you, you can add in your own open telemetry metrics, for example. So we can add in here some, some counters for how, how often has the game been played or how, how often which player has, has won. Uh, we, we can also add some, some additional span attributes. Uh, so, so those are things you can then do while, while manual instrumentation. I left in some to-dos for you. We will not go through them, but if you then maybe review all of that later uh, for yourself, then, then you can play around with it and say like, okay, how, how can I replicate those things? Right. Um, I think the next step that then remains is um, that we then deploy our application to the cluster, right? So this was now said the way how you do manual instrumentation. And now the situation we want just to introduce you to is that we have the front end now manually instrumented. instrumented. As I said, we will use something we prepared, but, but you could technically now use the code you uh, created in a new container image. Um, and then for the other applications later, we will see the, the auto instrumentation, right? So let me now deploy everything to, to the cluster. Um, let me go into the right direction again. I think I can finish the application now. We don't need it anymore. So we have, um, have deployed all the, the applications, right? Let me go back and then let's see how everything looks like. Right, so you see like there's the two backends, the front end, uh, the load generator. So all of that is being created right now. It takes a little bit. Um, and then we should be happy and, and up and running. You could now start also an additional proxy to expose the front end service and, and play some games on your own. But since we have the load generator running, we don't need that. Uh, yeah, and the next part is then now, how can we auto instrument uh, the remaining services? Yeah, and for the auto instrumentation, we're gonna use the uh, the CRD. But what the CRD actually does, um, it uses the Open Telemetry auto instrumentation and agents, and ingests, injects them into our workloads. Uh, but we're gonna see that in a minute. 
So let's first create the instrumentation resource. So this is how it looks like. I set the exporter endpoints to our OTL collector that we deployed uh, earlier in the observability backend namespace. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. And we're gonna sample all the requests. So we're gonna keep all the telemetry data. Let's go to instrumentation step. So the CR has been created. And now we're gonna instrument the, the, uh, the front end, back end one and back end two. But the front end is already instrumented, but it's not configured. So right now, if I take a look at logs, right? They should be, it should be printing the something to the standard output. What is the namespace? It's a tutorial application. Um, so maybe I can write something like this. Yeah, and we see we see actually logs. But you have to trust me that the the application is instrument in just sending the telemetry to, to the console. Um, so now we're gonna use the operator to inject the SDK configuration. Um, so we're gonna apply the so first of all. We're gonna first take a look at the at the pod of the front end application, how it looks like. And as you can see, the auto instrumentation is named enabled, and then we are just setting the, the URLs for the backend one and backend two. And there is no other configuration for the open telemetry SDK. Uh, and now we're gonna apply the instrumentation annotation with value true, which means the operator will use uh, kind of the only CR, the only instrumentation CR that we created in the namespace. Um, and the, the, the annotation is inject-sdk, which tells the operator to just inject the SDK configuration. It will not change the de deployment and it will not it will not inject any kind of like libraries into this uh, container. It will just inject the configuration. So let me go back, uh, apply the annotation. If I apply the annotation to the pod spec in the deployment, Kubernetes will restart the pod. Now I will get the pod spec again. And we're gonna see what operator configured. So the operator in this case let me take a look. It seems like it didn't do anything. Uh, okay, so maybe there is some Why there's two pods? Yeah, the old one is still there. Yeah, so it's the output has like a list of like two pods for the front end. And so this is the second, this is the one that uh, has changed. And we see um, that the operator configures the open telemetry series name, which is the, the front end deployment name, the endpoint for to sending the OTLP data and then the Kubernetes resource attributes, which are in this environment variable. And as well, the, the propagators and the sampling configuration. So now I should be able to access traces in Grafana. Yep, 
yeah, and we, we are getting some traces for the front end application. Right now, there is only a single span. Uh, and we see that in the resources, we are getting the Kubernetes resource attributes uh, to describe, you know, what is the container name, deployment name, namespace, and so on. Okay, now let's instrument the backend one service, which is a Python. Uh, and we're gonna do the same workflow. We're gonna get the pod spec and see how it looks like. There is no, pretty much there is no configuration. And we're gonna apply again the inject annotation, but in this case, we're gonna choose to inject Python. So the operator in this case will inject the Python instrumentation libraries, but as well will configure the SDK. Okay, so now I should get the new port. And so how does it, um, how does it work, right? Like how are the instrumentation libraries injected? They are injected by using the init container. So the operator will inject, will change the pod spec, will add the init container. And this init container just copies the auto instrumentation libraries for Python into the directory called otl instrumentation, which is a volume that is as well mounted to your application container. And then it configures Python runtime to use those libraries. And so Python will start with we'll load the auto instrumentation and then will load your application. So it's using the Python path in this case uh, to, to, to tell the Python the, that it has to load the, the libraries. And then again, the same uh, Otel SDK config. We can access traces. For the backend one, yeah, we see there are some traces already. Uh, and Java, very similarly, I will not get the, the original pod. We're gonna just apply the inject annotation and see how, how it configures JVM. So it's again a list of pods. So the first one should be the one that has changed. Um, and again, like we see the init container with copying, that is copying the Java agent. And then the operator is configuring the Java tool options, uh, environment variable, and JVM uses this uh, environment variable to to configure the JVM, right? And in this case, we are setting the Java agent. Um, Java agent, again, it's loaded into memory and then it will see all the classes as are being loaded, uh, you know, from for the application. All right, and now we have instrumented all the applications, so we should see the entire trace. starting in front end and finishing in back end. We don't see the front end service. Yeah, but it should, it should show up here anyway on the left. It's six minutes ago, so we are not getting any traces from the front end. Maybe. Two. Let's take a look. Front end seems to be running. Let's take a look. It has the config for hotel. The 
endpoint looks good. The sampling looks okay as well. I will just try to delete it. I know it's 20 seconds. Okay. Mm -hmm. This one? Yeah, so it seems to work. Maybe, maybe there is a delay uh, in like getting the spans, you know, through the collector and then to, uh, to tempo and then maybe um, it just takes some time to, to propagate them and make them available for query. Okay, so yeah. Okay, and so we ended up with this architecture. Uh, we have the front end service backend, the backend one. And all of those are reporting telemetry data to our hotel collector that is then sending each individual single signal to, to different backend. So for, for metrics to Mimir, for logs to Loki, and for traces to Tempo. So we, we already seen this in the in Grafana. And now we're going to take a look at like different use cases, how we can kind of improve our, our instrumentation and get a bit more value or, or kind of solve different use cases. And we're going to start with the resource attributes, uh, which are very important. Uh, so on Kubernetes environment, we, we should understand like from where the data is coming from, right? So we should be getting attributes for to identify what was the deployment name, what was the, um, the container name, what was the, uh, the pod, pod name, the pod UID, and all these kind of Kubernetes attributes. There is different ways how we can do that. If we use the instrumentation CR, the operator knows the pod, and it can figure out all this data for you, and it will inject those, uh, those resource attributes as environment variable to the application container. So we are using this approach you know, in, the, in the demo. The second approach is to use the collector CR and configure the Kubernetes attributes processor. Uh, so in this case, we can deploy the collector as a deployment and uh, you know, have multiple pods sending data to this collector. And the attribute processor will kind of recognize from where the data is coming and will call the API server and get the attributes for you. The last approach uh, is when you're using, again, collector CR, but deployed as a sidecar. In this case, the operator will set, again, the, attri the attributes as environment variable, and you just need to configure the resource detection processor to kind of use that environment variable and set the attributes to, uh, and to kind of consume them and set them on, on data. Uh, there is as well a link for a blog post that describes how to set it up. What we're going to do right now is to update the instrumentation CR, and we're going to enable collection of the Kubernetes UID attributes. So we are getting the, the pod name, deployment name, but we are not getting the, the UID ones. So I need to go to the resource. I think it's this one. And I'm going to just copy it. I have changed it, but actually nothing happens because the the change is not propagated to the workloads because the 
the configuration or the, the attributes are set as the environment variable, right? So we need to restart our applications to, to let the operator uh, you know, change the environment variable and inject the new, new configuration. And now we can go again to Grafana. Let me just first check if everything looks okay. Yeah, the new pods are running. Yeah, let's try this for instance. And now in the resource attributes, I should see the UID attributes. Yeah, we are getting for the deployment, pod, replica set. Okay. And the next kind of use case is sampling. And a sampling is a technique how we choose our how we decide what like what amount of data we want to store and send to to backend. Uh, so in our previous setup, we we were using 100% sampling. So we are storing all the telemetry data that we are collecting. We're gonna change that and you know save only 25%. So we're gonna again edit the instrumentation CR. And in the sampling sampler, we're gonna edit the argument and set it to 0.25. And again, like the sampling configuration is on the SDK is configured for the environment variable. So we have to again restart the workloads. Seems okay. Um, if you would like to, to see like what are all the possible configuration options for the type and the argument, uh, there is a link to the SDK, SDK config. Now I'm gonna open Grafana dashboard for the collector and we should hopefully see that the amount of received traces uh, decreased. So this is the success. Change it to the last 15 minutes. And we see that it's receiving less and less traces. And yeah, over time it should stabilize in like for 25% of the original value. This approach works and you will probably have to experiment with uh, sampling quite a bit when you kind of deploy or when you instrument your applications. Uh, and like restarting your workloads is not ideal. And in Otel project, there is a sampler called Jaeger Remote Sampler, which allows you to set the sampling without the, the restart. The way it works that is that you deploy the Otel collector and there you configure extension with the sampling configuration and then the SDK will connect the collector and will, you know, can receive and uh, update the sampling config. All right, so the last topic I want to cover here is the kind of data manipulation. 
as Ben has showed us, the collector can, it's a pipeline, right? And in the, in the middle, uh, there is, uh, you can configure processor. And in these processors, uh, there is a lot of functionality. And um, what they usually do is that they can manipulate the data. Uh, which can be super useful for you know, removing any sensitive data or you can kind of extract new data from already existing attributes. Um, there's a couple of processors that will kind of offers you this functionality, but we're gonna use the attributes processor and we're gonna use it to extract the player name from the HTTP target attribute. So maybe let's go back to to Grafana, let's see how the HTTP target looks like. It's not in the resource attributes, it's in the attributes. So in this case, you know, this is the, the root endpoint, there is just slash, but if I go, I believe to the backend, there should be, uh, it, it will look like this, roll dice, player equals Christina. And we want to just extract the Christina into a separate new attribute. And this could be useful for if we need to then, uh, you know, query the, the player name. So I'm gonna edit the collector CR. and just copy the, the config into processor section. And I have to as well put the attributes processor into the pipeline for traces. And let's see if the collector uh, was restarted. It looks perfect. So now we can go again to Grafana. And we should see player attribute somewhere. Yeah, it's actually me, that's cool. Okay, so yeah, what I want to show you here essentially that the collector is like hardly configurable and um, there is a bunch of processors that give you a uh, lot of functionality to manipulate the data. And in the next section, we will see how you can even use the processor to extract uh, metrics. We'll show that to extract metrics from uh, from traces. Hi everyone. So before we extract metrics from traces, um, we're going to look at the auto instrumentation that we did earlier. I'll close a few tabs. So when we added auto instrumentation, it didn't just affect traces, we also got logs and metrics from that. So these are the metrics that we are now getting because of the auto instrumentation we added before. Uh, front end actually has some instrumentation. So these games we can see as well as uh, who is winning, how many times. Um, there are also, nobody can win, we can tie. Um, but from the auto instrumentation, we mostly see these HTTP metrics um, for both front end, back end one, and back end two. We 
we can see our server responses, which are 200, which is great, as well as the request duration. Um, and then for backend two, we, since it's using JVM, we also get some CPU and memory usage. Uh, one thing you might notice is backend one has Prometheus metrics, but since we're not currently scraping backend one, we're not getting those metrics in Grafana. So the collector can collect metrics using a scrape config, like you can see here, where we list the job name, we provide targets, and then the collector goes and scrapes them. But if you're deploying a lot of services or your um, service makeup is changing often, you probably don't wanna go in, modify the configuration, and redeploy your collector every time. So Prometheus has something called service and pod monitors, which allow you to watch your services and pods, and then it updates the collector so it knows um, what to scrape. So in order to use the pod and service monitors, we just need to um, install the CRDs. So we'll do that quickly now. And then when we check our CRDs, we can see both pod monitors and service monitors there. So the way that we um, use the collector to, uh, the way that we use the collector and service and pod monitors together is with a service called the target allocator. Um, it uses the monitors to discover targets and then it splits up those targets among all of the collectors in the stateful set. So previously when we deployed the collector, it was as a deployment. Um, so the main difference in the CRD that we're going to deploy now is it's a stateful set, as well as various configuration for the target allocator. So we need to enable the target allocator. There are a few different allocation strategies for how you want various targets from the scrape configs to be allocated to the collectors. Um, and then, things like the image, number of replicas. Prometheus CR is important. That's what um, enables watching the service and pod monitors um, and using that in the target allocator. Uh, another important piece is we need to use the Prometheus receiver in the collector itself that we're deploying. Um, so we wanna set that up as well as it has a target allocator configuration. We just need to tell it uh, what endpoint to hit to get its scrape config from the target allocator. So when we apply this chart, um, we'll deploy our new collector as well as the target allocator for it. Um, and we also need a special cluster role that grants the permissions that the target allocator needs to see the, um, the service and pod monitors. Oh yeah, so we also need service monitors uh, and we'll add those here. We are monitoring um, the back in one service, which we know has the Prometheus metrics, as well as you can monitor uh, the collector and target allocator as well. So we'll be doing that. So um, now that we've deployed everything, we can see our new um, Otel collector is called Otel Prom CR collector. Uh, we have three of them in our stateful set as well as two target allocators. Um, yeah, and everything's running so we can check. Oh, we should check our service monitors too. Yep, they're all here. Um, one for the collector, one for the target allocator, and one for backend one service. So now when we go back, well, this may take a few seconds. 
Usually I see it first in the collector graphs. Um, we have a scrapes graph. So previously the hotel collector that we first deployed was scraping just itself. Um, but now we can see additional scrapes um, to new targets that we've just added. Although it's very small on your screen. Yeah, so we can see uh, scrapes as well as a slight increase in Prometheus metrics, um, scrape duration, and just other collector metrics. When we go back to our app, oh, there we go. Now we can see metrics from back in one. So somebody has already come in and had Prometheus metrics running on this backend one, and now we can see them in Grafana. So we can see um, what dice rolls we're getting per second, uh, the numbers. We can see that some people are cheating with sevens and eights on our six-sided die. Um, and we also get uh, some just regular Python uh, garbage collection and CPU metrics. Since we're also scrape, uh, scraping the target allocator, we also get metrics from that. Um, so we can see any events that happen for service discovery or failures, um, the targets per collector. So so it's pretty evenly split um, between our three collectors that are running, how many targets they scrape. Um, We've found all three collectors, which is great. And everything's looking good. So the final thing we want to look at for metrics is in the collector, you may notice that there are span metrics graphs, but we don't have those metrics yet. Span metrics is a connector um, that we can configure in the OTEL collector that can transform spans into request, error, and duration metrics. Um, a connector is just a special component that can consume data as an exporter in one pipeline and then act as a receiver in another pipeline. So in this case, it'll be an exporter in the traces pipeline, but then a receiver in the metrics pipeline. So um, right now, all of our traces are going to the original OTEL collector that we deployed. So that's what we want to modify to add the span metrics connector. And then we need to add it to the pipelines. So it's an exporter and a receiver. Yep. Um, so now that we've modified this, we just need to restart our collector and then Hopefully, we will see new metrics. Just wait a few moments. Oh, 
Oh, here they are. So now, uh, from the spans we saw before, you could see the get on roll dice um, on our backend servers, as well as the get slash for front end. Um, and then we can also see backend one, since we've added scraping on the metrics endpoint. We also see that in our server calls as well. And then client calls, our only client is the front end, um, so that's what we see here. And then other internal calls are also included. Basically, any spans that it can convert, um, the, the, it will. And then you can see them as metrics. So next, Yuri is going to talk about opportunities for logs. Thank you, Krishina. Before uh, yeah, we start uh, talking uh, about logs, let me uh, just close. Oh, uh, you just closed the tabs, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, as uh, metrics and trace are covered, uh, as the open telemetry is capable uh, to handle uh, the logs flows, uh, I give in that example, uh, file log receiver, which can be configured to read logs from a file. Uh, file log receiver is uh, just an example of uh, many uh, different receivers that we have on the Open Telemetry Collector Contrib repo. Let me just open to have a look. As you can see, uh, we have uh, different uh, folders uh, divided by exporters, uh, receivers, and if you go to the uh, receiver folder, you can see, yeah, like a patch receiver, a crony, and, and so on and so forth. And we open uh, the file log receiver folder, you're going to see uh, basically a doc how to use it, and you can see yeah, the definition uh, in the bottom of the page, like, okay, you have to define uh, which file will be included in your uh, receiver, uh, basically defining your collector instance and how you use uh, the regular expression to read uh, the logs from. Going back to the uh, example, uh, I just designed uh, this uh, diagram uh, we have a file input, a regular expression in the middle, and then basically the logs uh, will go out, will flow uh, to the log instance that we just uh, deployed uh, with the colleagues. Uh, we have why uh, the file log has uh, this parser as a regular expression, because uh, logs can differ by uh, uh, the container runtime, and you can configure uh, the regular expression for which container runtime uh, you are using running your workload. Uh, I will use, I will deploy a new instance uh, for our collector, our open telemetry collector, uh, using now uh, the deployment mode as a daemon set. Let me just apply that. Okay, as we can see, we have a new uh, demo site running on the observability backend namespace. 
and uh, if you yeah want to check uh, the gmail site for any but yeah the, just yeah, check it out through this command that is described on the repo okay just have a look at so there we go then um, we should see uh, right now uh, the logs on the Grafana dashboard uh, coming from uh, the OTLMP instance uh, configured by this uh, file log receiver. Uh, let's go to the dashboard. We have here. And if I open, for example, when I uh, roll the dice, I have all uh, that information. Uh, just to yeah, give you uh, also an option because I mentioned a lot regarding this file log receiver, but uh, OTLP is also capable uh, to receive and transmit logs using the native protocol OTLP. And then uh, if you simply uh, don't want to read uh, the logs from, from a file, then you can use uh, the OTLP protocol. It's basically uh, what I uh, have for the logs and uh, after that I will just give some bullets uh, regarding what we have, uh, what is coming from the open telemetry operator. Uh, we have five, uh, four uh, actually here, uh, different topics or different uh, challenges for uh, the open telemetry operator. Uh, nowadays, we have auto instrumentation for .NET, uh, Python, and uh, Java, Node.js, yeah, Java, Node.js applications. And uh, we are planning to release uh, the auto instrumentation for uh, Golang applications. Okay, and uh, also as a second challenge, we have this open agent uh, management protocol uh, bridge, uh, which Christina's team is working also. And then, yeah, and then we are uh, uh, getting this as a second uh, challenge, as a second Second bullet for the, the roadmap. Sorry, I forgot just the road. I missed the, the point. And uh, for me, uh, the third one, uh, the simplifying uh, the operator CRGs when we have um, a CR uh, configured for the collector instance, we have to define uh, the whole config, uh, including the receivers, processors, and the pipelines, exporters. And what we are trying as a concept, uh, we are trying to uh, develop, uh, develop some opinionated uh, CRGs with the, when a, receiving a CR, with the receiver configuration, another CR for uh, exporter configuration, and so on and so forth. But uh, for now, is uh, we are just accepting new ideas and I'd like also to invite any one of you uh, yeah, to help us uh, developing that uh, simplification of our CRs, CRGs. And also uh, we have, as Pavel mentioned, uh, we have four different deployments. We have Sidecar, uh, State Full Set Deployment and uh, the Set. Uh, all of them, except Sidecar, uh, when we change uh, the configuration, doesn't get reloaded. And as a final uh, bullet for our roadmap, uh, we are developing when we deploy a collector as a Sidecar, uh, we will uh, reload uh, the collector instance, okay? Then this is our uh, challenge for yeah, the next months. And I'd like to invite you, anyone, again, if you want to contribute, uh, we have the open telemetry uh, operator repo. And, and I guess that's it. Thank you all.
questions? Do you have any questions? Sorry, yes. Uh, I noticed there's a lot of time the version spe specified for the collectors. I assume if I upgrade OpenTelemetry, I would have to go through the individual collectors, check their versions, and maybe update them too, I guess, right? Uh, yes, yeah, so do you mean the image, right, for the collector? Yes. Yeah, so the operator, if you don't specify the image, it will use the default one, which is the the one for all, the, the core distribution, right? And this one is set as a flag, I think, on the operator deployment. So you can override it with the, uh, with the contrib distribution as a flag on the operator. And once you update the operator, then all the instances will be, uh, you don't have to then okay. you know, go and change the, the image field okay. for your- So it would be service. awesome if it would be possible just to override the image name, not the tag. So I could get this auto update feature, but use my own repository. Exactly. Yeah, you just specify the the collector distribution on the operator. I think it's on the fly. Ah, okay. Of the okay, yeah. that's awesome. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah, there is one. Thank you for uh, explaining the uh, the whole structure of the project. Um, I have a question regarding the CRDs responsible for injecting instrumentation into the into the pods. Uh, is is there a possibility of uh, using the extensions or with custom uh, custom instrumentation as well in uh, these CRDs? For example, in case of uh, in case of Java, when we have jar with the agent, we also need separate jars with our develop uh, extensions. At least that's how I approach it in my project. Uh, is there like a dedicated field in CRD or plan to introduce that? There isn't one, but uh, the instrumentation CR has option to configure the init container image that contains the agent. So you can build your own init container image with Java instrumentation and your extensions uh, but it's not going to work because the, the operator will copy just the Java agents. So no, the answer is no, it's not going to work. If the, if the extension is a separate jar, right now there is no way to do it. But if one embeds uh, this into the extension and compiles their own uh, yes. the agent, then it would work. So there is a field to customize something like this. Yeah, there is a field to customize the init container with the Java agent. Okay. So if, yeah, but it's a good proposal. Maybe if you open issue on the operator, we can take it from there. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about serverless, like, you know, how OpenTelemetry Collector can play with, for example, Node.js AWS Lambda application, like what would be the approach to I don't know, flash uh, batch processor spans and I send them to the collector. And is there any out of the box solution that uh, supports uh, serverless? Um, so with, with, with the operator, there, there, there's nothing related to that, but there is a project right now really looking also into serverless instrumentation. Uh, I, I would recommend that, that you reach out to that project. So there's a lot of things going on right now. Um, that, that's the best answer I can give you right now. So look into the, I think it's called Hotel Fast uh, Slack channel over in CNCF Slack. Uh, they are highly looking for people asking those kinds of questions and giving feedback on that. All right, thank you. But I believe the SDK should flush the, the in-flight data before it shuts down. Um, <laughs> or, or, or Actually, it. I tried this and uh, the Lambda doesn't wait for the flash, even if I try to await for flash function. Mm -hmm. So I did try this and yeah, I use batch span processor, but I'm not sure why it's not, you know, waiting actually, right? I did see some tickets about this. That's why I wanted to like, you know, mm -hmm. best practice approach to AWS anyway, uh, to serverless. Thanks.
Uh, thank you for the talk. I was wondering, um, first of all, I think most of the time we want like automatic and manual instrumentation, right? So we want the basic automatic instrumentation, but also custom business metrics, for example. Um, in that case, would I have to, or what would I have to do to get both? Do I have to just um, deploy the automatic instrumentation and add manual metrics somehow, or do I just have to do the manual approach? Mm. So, so if you look at the, the front-end application that we created in the demo, it already has some open telemetry in it even before we did the instrumentation with the Node SDK. And this is actually what you can do. So, so the API, when, when you call it, uh, and no SDK is loaded, you should just, nothing should happen, right? So, and you can even combine this with the auto instrumentation. So, I think also if you look in the, we have the open telemetry demo. So, if you go into the open telemetry docs and look at the open telemetry demo, uh, some of them do, are doing act, actually that, right? So, there's some Java applications, there's some business uh, metrics and business attributes being collected, and then the Java agent is used for the, for the automatic instrumentation. So, you can, do some mixing of that. There is sometimes some situations where, where things, let's say, work not as you might expect it, but then I um, ask you to rely on the documentation or reach out to, to the individual project and, and ask for that. Okay, thank you very much. And just one more thing. <laughs> um, I was wondering, so we just added a lot of components, um, but we also had logs and metrics in the beginning of the setup without adding the collectors. I was wondering how that worked. So we kind of had metrics in the Grafana dashboard in Mimir before adding the Prometheus stuff, and yeah. Okay, uh, so, so the, the, the most of the languages right now are exposing already a bunch of traces and metrics, right? So if you look at Python and Node.js, uh, they give you a, a, some HTTP metrics for, for some standard frameworks just out of the box. What we also wanted to show you with the, with the Prometheus work is that you can mix and match that, right? Because this is one very important part of open telemetry that, that it really helps you on, on your journey with op, uh, observability. And if you already have something like Prometheus, then you can just take that. And the really cool thing is, I think, with the, the Java agent is doing this already, it's also giving you log auto instrumentation, right? So it's uh, looking in, into your code and it's looking for your log framework and then uh, turning that into into OTLP as well. So this is also something. Stay tuned. The next few days and weeks, some some more stuff on that will will come and and make those things a lot easier for you. Great, thank you. So we also didn't have metrics at the beginning until auto instrumentation was added. So I want to make that clear. Auto instrumentation is what allowed us to get any of those app metrics. All we had were collector metrics from collector scraping itself. Same for logs, your yeah. assess. So one more question. Um, can you say something about uh, workloads on virtual machines? How to get the logs into the collector? Uh, I'm sure there is a approach. We okay. don't work with the uh, virtual machines. Uh. All right. <laughs> I mean, what, what you can, of course, use is the, the file log receiver, right, that, that Yuri showed you. You can, of course, also use this on a, on a virtual machine. And if you go into the collector contrib repository, there's a few other log receivers as well, right? So, so that, that's really the same with, with the metrics. Uh, you, you can use different protocols that you have already uh, to, to scrape those, those files or any, any other source of logs that you have. And not only logs, there are also, um, what is it called? A host metrics receiver, which is extracts metrics for you from the host in this, yeah, you can enable something like this. And you can also mount. You already get <laughs> And uh, you also can mount the, the, uh, the file log as a, as a volume and basically tells you the daemon site or the uh, collector, hey, look, uh, read the file from this volume. No. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for the cool tools and the comprehensive uh, tutorial. And even though it's uh, Friday afternoon, <laughs> this was great. Um, one question regarding the auto instrumentation. I've been listening to the, uh, what was it, I guess, Pixies talk earlier, and they are doing this with. Uh, 
EBPF, I guess. I just wanted to know if you could like compare the um, solutions or the uh, yeah, what's the pros and cons in regarding. So I prefer this approach that you presented, to be honest, and uh, I'm already using it. And I just wanted to know if you see maybe some pros or cons in this. Thanks. I think it depends on the language. Um, so for instance, the Golang auto instrumentation from Otel is based on the eBPF, right? But Golang is natively compiled language. Um, like for Java, it like, doesn't make sense to me to write eBPF agent because then uh, you would have to understand how the virtual machine works and it's just much easier to write the, the bytecode manipulation for that, uh, which is the technology that the current Java agent uses. Um, it's, it's important in the auto instrumentation to kind of get the context from the runtime. Uh, so understand, you know, what is the handler name, what is the, uh, the HTTP path and all this data, right? And like at eBPF level, maybe it's, it's going to be way more trickier than, um, than on, the, on the JVM level. If you just, you know, comparing like Java and, and, uh, and eBPF. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and you can. And if you don't use uh, the auto instrumentation, you can also customize uh, how rich your data are. And then basically, this is, uh, I would say, the, the pros and cons. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Nope. So yeah, thank you very much.